in order to, to move from theory into practice, I think that the best thing we can do is to, to present a case study. And so I'm quite happy to have here today Francesco Starace. Francesco Starace is the CEO of uh, Ener Green Power. And so we will briefly present what they are doing. So I think it's a good example of a new Italy that is coming out. So we are not a startup, I want to clarify this. <laughs> we started up some time ago. <laughs> but we have uh, completed an IPO which was the largest in Europe in the last three years and it looks like it's going to stay the largest for some time. So um, I, I received the, uh, the invitation to participate to this Why Italy Matters to the World from uh, Fernando who is a dear friend and I thought it was a very good idea. Uh, there is a reason why we are interested in innovation and it, it has to do very much with the fact that in, uh, typically in electrical utilities innovation is not simply there. And, and the reason is that we, our business has a tendency to repeat itself in its own patterns uh, with an incredible success uh, and therefore innovation is not really that important. And, and this is not anymore the case if you look at what uh, I'm going to, to show you now. Uh, this is a picture that clearly is an impossible picture. There is never a moment where the whole world is in the night, but it's assembled taking pictures from satellites. And we use this to show where is it that uh, today the world is consuming energy. And this is a rough picture but because clearly it indicates where the lights are on is where, you, where energy is today consumed. Uh, so we have, uh, I think, quite a, a clear indication of the parts of the world that are hungry for energy and those that have not yet started consuming. But it's just a matter of time. We believe this is going to change. And a second picture is more a hieroglyph than a picture. It's a very interesting uh, trip in the past, starting from 1964 until now. This shows the pattern with which we have been consuming oil around the world, uh, starting from 30 billion barrels of oil a day in 1964. And that oil in 1964, we were paying $20. And for about 10 years, we've been consuming more and more oil. And the oil has been costing less and less. Until 73, when there was uh, a big oil shock, because uh, the Arabs uh, decided it was uh, enough. So we stopped for a couple of years. Uh, we stopped driving cars during weekends and all that kind of stuff that many of you were not even around at that time, but you know, <laughs> others were. And for some time we kept constant the consumption, oil jumped. It was an apocalypse uh, for the civilization, someone said, but uh, civilization took it in stride and started consuming again. And then you, you can read it on your own. So we are now over there in 2010 uh, we don't know whether 2011 will go on one direction or the other. Certainly we know there is kind of a loop that it's tying around our neck somewhere over there. And, and you can understand that if you show this chart to any oil expert, uh, he will immediately recognize it. He will tell you he does not know whether this is going to continue one way or another. And that the logic behind this chart is clearly only explicable looking at the past. But there is no way you can predict what's going to happen. For sure, all of us, our whole civilization, at least the one with the lights on, has been riding this uh, roller coaster, whether we are 
aware of it or not, we've been doing this. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of countries around the world and a lot of attention is now being devoted to renewable energy because renewable energy is a way to mitigate, not to eliminate, but to mitigate this kind of volatility. Uh, these are a lot of numbers, so I'm not going to read them all to you. But this shows what happened during 2010 to renewable energy worldwide. Uh, and I think you should only look at this number here. This is what happened during one year. In the world today, at the end of 2010, there is a million 300,000 megawatts of installed capacity producing an electrical energy with renewable sources. During 2010, which by no means we can consider a great year from an economic and investment standpoint, the world has installed 82,000 megawatts of renewable energy which is associated to about 180 billion euros, so roughly 250 billion dollars of investment worldwide. It's a huge figure, and it's a very high step. It's a 6.7% growth year on year, which compares to an 8.5% growth which we, we should have in order to match the wildest expectation of growth that the International Energy Agency has been able to put on the paper, which give a trebling of installed capacity in 2020. In the same time, so in the same year, 28 billion dollars, uh, euros were spent on R&D, of which 11 came from corporate sources. So a lot of money has been thrown into the investments and quite a lot also in R&D. And this is, the reason is the curve that you saw before. It is not very much only an environmental concern, but it is a lot driven by a very simple fact that a lot of places in the world where the lights are off, and particularly Latin America, Africa, are just getting renewable energy because they need energy. And they have a lot of renewable energy capabilities. They have an incredible wealth of resources over there. In fact, growth is expected to be surprisingly for many people, but not for those that look at this in close, very strong all over the world. And renewable energy growth is no more an incentive-driven fact. It's growing very fast in Latin America with no incentivization. It's growing very fast in Africa. Actually, it's the only part of the world with double-digit growth, 11% year on year. And it's expected to grow in North America where incentivization is relatively small. So that's the world of renewable energy. It's a huge, huge space. And Energreen Power, which is over there, it's one of the largest company in this uh, in this uh, in this space, but it's very small compared to the business we're in. In the world, we installed something around 80,000 megawatts in one year. We have 6,000 megawatts, the whole company. So that gives you an idea of the great fragmentation that exists in, the, in this industry and the incredible opportunities that uh, are there to capture if one looks at it on a global scale. Um, the time is really, I mean, we are a company that works with many technologies. We are not a wind company, we are not a solar company. We have a unique know-how in geothermal energy and also most of our production comes from hydro, which is the oldest form of renewable energy that you find around the world. That fact is a strange fact. We are quite unique in the renewable energy uh, space. We like it like this. We like the combination of technologies. And I will give you two small examples of why we do that. This is a typical curve that shows what is mature in this space and what is not. And for, for the people that are sitting here, perhaps the most interesting space is this one in the back here, where you have technologies that are still in the labs. Here you have marine uh, technologies, waves, tidal currents, uh, you have some uh, thermal solar development that is moving out of the labs into some early commercial phase. And 
you look over there and you see wind is already a mature technology, biomass and fuel are seem to be a mature technology. We believe <laughs> the innovation that needs to be applied to these uh, technologies is still very large and there is a lot, a lot of work to do. Just a small example for you to understand what we're talking about. Ten years of development on wind. In, um, if you take in 1968, the Rolling Stones had a concert in Altamont, close by. In this movie that you can still find somewhere, apart from the concert and, and the mess that happened over there, you see bl brief glimpses of the first wind turbines that were installed in California in Altamont, and they were very, very small turbines. They were turbines that were less than 60 kilowatt. This, this 60 kilowatt range was reached in, in the 80s. And this stuff uh, is still there. By the way, if you go to Altamont, they didn't want to take them away. So they're still this mini turbines. That Today, we have huge machines. These machines have been the subject of uh, an incredible development. If you take the machines that we have today and the machines that existed 10 years ago and you put them in the same spot, the energy you produce is 77% more. 10 years of development on a technology that we all think is already mature. You know, what can be invented in, in a blade that turns around? W what else, you know? Well, a lot. Try to drive a car that is uh, 15 years ago and, and see the difference with today's cars. There's a lot of innovation that can be applied. Same stuff for uh, solar panels. I'm not going to give you the solar pitch. This is not solar panels uh, curve. Uh, uh, this is an experience that we all had. When we decide to buy an LCD screen TV, we know that at that moment, the moment we buy it, we are making the mistake because we know next week is going to be the week in which a new model will come in, which will cost less and will be much better. And this is what is going on. This is the curve of liquid crystal displays and plasma screens through a few years. I, and I don't know why you have these asterisks here, but I'm telling you, this is 2002, and this is five years after. What happens is that, 2003, what, what happens is that this curve is the curve that is driving the cost of solar panels throughout the, the present years. This is, is happening today in the solar panel business. It's just because it's basically the only product in the uh, renewable energy uh, production uh, value chain that has something a lot in common with consumer electronics. Digital cameras, LCD displays, computers, uh, anything. That, that camera, anything. Um, now, what is our business in this? And what is the reason why we are here? We are not an innovative company. Our innovation is not in the de developing, identifying new products. We just want you guys to do that. We need you to work at these things. What we want is we want to tell you what we need. And what we are trying to do with this, we try to combine existing technologies in original ways. We try to use ideas that you have to generate and apply to our business in an innovative fashion. That's the innovation we can do. So we are not going to invent a new panel, we are not going to invent a new turbine, we are not going to invent a new machine. If we are stupid, we can't do that. What we can do, we can take a new machine and apply it to an old machine and combine the two. This is a small example of that. You know, this is a typical solar, uh, thermal solar, uh, solar trough, that's called, because it looks like one of these things where pigs eat into the troughs. And this is heating uh, a fluid going in through that pipe. This fluid is hot. And what to do with the heat? Typically, it's burnt. It's, it, it's, it's um, used to generate steam, and the steam goes in a turbine and stuff like that. But then there is another source of heat, and this, is, has, this has to do with earthquakes and with what happens below our, our crust. We are sitting in a very 
special part of the world here, you know, this is a very seismic zone. It's not the only one. The whole ring of the Pacific, it's so-called ring of fire, is a place where tectonic plaques go under one another. And these are all areas where geothermal energy is extremely interesting and abundant. What is geothermal energy? It's heat coming from below ground, and we use it to generate electricity. Italy was the first country in the world to generate electrical power with geothermal energy, and up to mid-50s, it's been the only one to do that. And this is one of the things that you have to remember when you do the white paper. Uh, the geothermal energy was discovered and, and, distribu and used in Italy for a long time. We still have, today, by far the largest know-how in terms of geothermal energy. But today, what we're doing, we are combining geothermal energy and solar energy, solar thermal energy, because they're all both sources of heat. We are combining them into power generation plants that are a hybrid between the two. There's a lot of work to do. This is a project that we are uh, developing in the US, in Nevada, in the desert of Nevada, where we have the two largest binary cycle geothermal plants. There, we, we are now applying solar troughs in order to have heat during the day, coupled with heat coming from below ground, and generating power, combining two energy sources. Is this innovative? Yes, the idea is innovative. Are we doing the solar trough design? No. Did we invent the binary cycle machines? No. We would like guys like you to come with innovative ideas in order to add them to this kind of uh, um, way of producing power. And we think that explaining you in detail these things will probably generate your, your ideas, and we hope that something will come out of it. Thank you very much.